speak. So the, 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 the topic of my, my presentation is about uh, Georgian view uh, on Ukraine. Um, I'm not representing Georgia. I have not this uh, ambition to represent Georgia, especially since I'm not anymore in government and my views are not those of the, of the government. Uh, they are rather different. Uh, I'm also currently a, a French uh, civil servant, so I'm not uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the French uh, uh, general position on, on, on Ukraine. It's uh, only my personal uh, views, uh, observations as an academic, um, and they are shaped or uh, influenced by my uh, experience as a former um, chief negotiator of uh, association agreement uh, negotiations uh, with the EU and uh, also as a person who uh, uh, studies the region, uh, I mean the, the, the Caucasus and broader uh, eastern neighborhood region uh, since uh, now many years. Um, so I will divide my presentation, I don't know how equal these uh, two parts uh, uh, of my presentations, presentation will be, but into two parts. Uh, first on the parallels and similarities uh, between the, 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 the conflict, current conflict in Ukraine and the war in Georgia in 2008. Um, and then the second part about the, the Western, uh, mainly European uh, uh, attitudes, uh, interpretations, uh, policies uh, towards these uh, uh, two conflicts. So starting with the first, uh, um, uh, first issue, I will uh, divide it into several uh, points. First, first point about the, when, when we talk about similarities and the parallels, of course, there are no uh, entirely uh, identical uh, situations. Uh, two countries are different. They have different history. I mean, Georgia and Ukraine, they have different uh, uh, trajectories, even under the Soviet Union and uh, after the end of Soviet Union. The countries have different, uh, so the countries are uh, of different size. Ukraine is much bigger uh, than Georgia. Uh, Ukraine geographically is uh, somehow also closer to, uh, to Europe than, than uh, to the uh, principle of the center of Europe than, than Georgia. But, uh, and I will not uh, hesitate uh, to point out these differences, but the similarities are um, uh, even more numerous. Uh, first uh, set of similarities is the similarity of um, uh, Russian attitudes towards uh, these countries, towards the, the idea of the independence of, two, of these two countries, the idea of the statehood of these two countries, uh, towards the idea of uh, the free choice of these two countries uh, um, uh, to, to decide um, uh, their foreign policy. And there, there are similarities. Um, uh, first, about um, general attitudes. Uh, general attitudes of the Russian elite. I will, I will, not, I will not discuss the general attitude of, of the uh, simple citizens of, of Russia, but the elites uh, who are the elites, uh, uh, the political and administrative elites, because in Russia it's quite difficult now to separate these two. So the, the Russian elites about these two countries, uh, they, they, their views are uh, a bit different because Ukraine is much closer. Ukraine is part of the first circle, um, the Slavic circle. So Russia, Ukraine, and uh, Belarus are probably this first circle. Um, and uh, there is this old myth that, okay, Ukraine is uh, uh, for centuries a part of uh, uh, Russia, and even the, the Russian history has, has started in Kiev. This is a Russian narrative that is uh, somehow shared by many in Europe without ask, without. Uh, uh, questioning this, this national narrative, each country has its own national narrative. That, that should be, an, any social scientist should, should question this social, this, this uh, national narrative. But uh, many people in, in Europe, and uh, I can um, uh, say that in France it's the same, they can say, oh, come on, Ukraine is such a close um, place for, for Russia that even their histories are so interpenetrated that uh, you cannot really talk about Ukraine as a, as a separate entity. And uh, so there's lots of um, a shared um, uh, myths uh, about, about, uh, about this. And uh, very few people in Europe consider Ukrainian national narrative, which is also a national narrative, so it can be questioned. And, uh, uh, and uh, 
disconstructed uh, uh, that, that says that Kiev, Russia, Kiev, Rus is the ancestor of Ukrainian state and not the Russian state. That Moscow is, is the ancestor of Russian state. So these two, uh, two di different uh, stories are not equally shared in Europe. They consider that the Russian narrative is more, uh, uh, more uh, how to say, has more, more public, more audience. Um, uh, but uh, without this, uh, Georgia also represents a, a special, um, uh, special, uh, special uh, feelings for the Russians have special feelings for Georgia. It's a Christian country, uh, Orthodox country. Uh, together with Moldova and Armenia, they represent this second circle. And uh, Georgia was kind of... Um, jewel of the crown for the Caucasus. It was a central country in the Caucasus, and it was very important to have Georgia inside the empire, so the Tsarist empire, and then later uh, Soviet Union. And Georgian intelligentsia and Georgian elites has, have developed also a very strange and ambiguous um, relationship with Russia. Many of them were very successful in Russia. Uh, uh, some of them uh, became very prominent uh, military leaders uh, under the Tsarist period, under the Soviet Union also you had, a, at the beginning at least, uh, before the, uh, the, the, death, uh, uh, the death of Stalin, many Georgians were quite prominent in Moscow, politically speaking. And Georgian elites were divided. So the one, and also artistic and intellectual elites uh, were quite well represented in Russia. And they um, used, uh, they, they, they were themselves behaving like a, the talented kids of the empire. So the Russians liked Georgian music, Georgian dances, Georgian cuisine, uh, Georgian arts, Georgian cinema, but they, they, they remained like, you know, the talented kids. They are not mature enough to have a state. They are not mature enough to, to be independent, to decide their, about their own fate. Uh, and many Georgians under the Tsarist and also Soviet periods uh, have accepted this, uh, um, this um, equation. And they played, they continued to play this role of uh, of a, a you know, talented kid and uh, to please the, 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 the center. At the same time, they did not hesitate uh, to, to criticize also Moscow, but that was uh, very, you know, for internal use. That was the, the position of uh, Shevardnadze, even when he was the first secretary of the Georgian Communist Party. He was the, one of the most loyal uh, persons to, towards Moscow, but at the same time, he was protecting these Georgian arts and uh, uh, intellectuals uh, from... Uh, uh, you know, uh, from some uh, repressions that could, uh, could come from Moscow, or also uh, protecting Georgian language, and Georgian language uh, continued to play a, a very important role under the Soviet Union. That's maybe the, the difference with Ukraine or maybe other, uh, let's say, Central Asian countries. Georgian language continued to be the, the uh, um, very vivid and uh, used in not only in administration, but also in education, including higher education. Uh, but the, the similarity is that uh, in both situations, Russian elites cannot consider Ukraine and uh, Georgia as really independent countries. Uh, at least independent can be formal. They can have their flag, their, their uh, representation in the UN, but they should remain under the, 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 uh, the, the realm of, uh, of uh, the Russian influence. And, of course, they cannot make independent decisions about their foreign policy. That was the case when in 1994, uh, Georgia signed an agreement after the defeat in Abkhazia, uh, first defeat in Abkhazia, in agreement with Moscow, in Moscow agreement that was a kind of protectorate of Moscow on Georgia, so the Russian military bases uh, uh, on Georgian territory, and plus, uh, informally, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the obligation for Georgia to agree with Moscow, the nomination, the nomination of power ministers, like Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior, and Minister of State Security. That was the, um, uh, the name uh, after the official um, uh, disappearance of, of KGB. So that was a period in the 90s when Russia had a de facto monopoly on, on Georgian affairs, uh, and uh, the, uh, Russia was alone uh, to, to, uh, to be present in, uh, in Georgian conflicts. There was no European involvement, there was no uh, international involvement, a very vague group of friends was uh, created in the UN, but uh, the influence of this group of friends was, was close, of, uh, close to zero. So first, this uh, attitude. Second, the attitude towards uh, the idea of, uh, of statehood, as I said, and uh, uh, Stefan Fulham has mentioned this uh, statement of Putin in 2008 that Ukraine was an artificial state and there were lots of 
other statements uh, uh, about uh, the, even the possibility to share Ukraine into two parts and Russia could take the, the, the major part and the, the westernmost part of Ukraine could go to Poland. Uh, same kind of uh, uh, reflections about Georgia. Many, many Russian experts and very close to, to, uh, to Putin were constantly declaring that Georgia should be divided into different parts and Western Georgia, Eastern Georgia, or Abkhazia, South Ossetia, plus other Georgian regions that Adjaria or Mingrelia. So that, that, that's, uh, this idea of, of um, um, uh, uh, absence of legitimacy of Georgian statehood was, was constant in, in Russian uh, different analyses. Um, uh, and uh, 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 shortly after 2008, uh, Mr. Lavrov, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, also has made this public statement that Georgia was a kind of anomaly in post-Soviet uh, space because uh, uh, that was the, at this time, uh, Yanukovych was already the president of, of Ukraine, so Georgia was maybe the last, uh, so besides Baltic states that were already a member of uh, both uh, European Union and NATO, Georgia has appeared uh, for, for him as an anomaly, and uh, this uh, um, discourse of, of uh, uh, about the anomaly, um, the Georgian anomaly was also constant. Uh, maybe one of the, um, uh, another uh, point of similarity is how, how uh, Russian establishment has reacted also after color revolutions. Um, uh, so this is maybe, maybe even more important than the general attitudes towards the, the idea of independence or statehood or nationhood of these countries. Colored revolutions is uh, uh, considered in Russia uh, by many as a, as a kind of Western plot. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, should be um, avoided in Russia uh, at any price. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, idea and discussions about democracy, uh, rule of law, etc., are considered as a Trojan horse um, that is uh, 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 promoted by the West in order to weaken Russia. You all remember this uh, uh, two major um, um, postulates of, of uh, Putin, uh, Putin regime. First is uh, democracy is not good for Russia because this is something that is uh, geographically and historically circumscribed to the Western Europe and, uh, and Northern America. We have tried democracy in Russia in, in the 90s uh, under Yeltsin and uh, it was anarchy and uh, uh, very weak uh, uh, Russia. So those who want democracy, they want weak Russia and anarchy in, in Russia. So uh, what uh, Putin has proposed to, to, to the Russian uh, citizens is that, okay, you will not have uh, this kind of democracy. We will have sovereign democracy. It's very specific uh, uh, kind of democracy where uh, I propose stability and also welfare and uh, uh, economic growth. And you basically, uh, you abandon uh, uh, your basic uh, uh, rights uh, that are uh, uh, enshrined in, in democratic uh, uh, regime. So when uh, Georgia and Ukraine, and I, I know of course that the first Georgia, uh, Ukrainian revolution and the Orange Revolution uh, was not a success after the, so for the, 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 the balance sheet after five years was, uh, was uh, rather a failure than, than success. Uh, but these two colored revolutions were seen by, uh, by, uh, by Putin and by, 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 uh, by Moscow, by Kremlin, as a, as a direct threat. And as a, the, the failure of these uh, two revolutions was uh, uh, something necessary to the survival, at least uh, uh, that's how they, they, they viewed these, these revolutions, that was something um, uh, to be uh, obtained at any price. So destabilization, uh, trying to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to help uh, uh, the pro-Russian uh, oppositions in these countries, etc., etc. Uh, this is quite uh, uh, interesting to, uh, to, to sh see the parallels uh, 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 both in Georgia and in, in Ukraine. The situation in uh, separatist regions uh, became uh, uh, very bad and tense and deteriorated into uh, an open war when, uh, uh, in, uh, in particular, historical moments. Uh, first in Georgia, it was in the beginning of the 90s, where it was a radically um, uh, anti-Russian, uh, anti-Soviet uh, uh, president, and then under uh, Saakashvili, from, starting from 2004. In Ukraine, uh, there were some separatist uh, attitudes in, in Crimea and maybe also in eastern uh, parts of Ukraine, but it has really started after uh, Yanukovych was uh, uh, ousted, and uh, 
it was also, it has become like public, uh, but a much uh, lesser level when uh, Yushchenko was president. Because first statements against the statehood of, of Ukraine about the possibility to divide Ukraine uh, appeared under, uh, and ironically that this time the president of Russia was not Putin, was, was Medvedev, and you all remember this. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, that was an interview that Mr. Medvedev gave to, to Russian television. He was in Sochi uh, during the summer with, uh, uh, with the uh, Russian military boats uh, behind him and uh, openly uh, attacking uh, uh, the, the Ukraine and the, the Yushchenko as a as a uh, as a rival and uh, uh, the, the, the 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 whole idea of this interview was that okay, we are ready to to defend our interests and that Ukraine is a, such a shaky state that it can disappear uh, very easily. Uh, so the territories, the conquest of territories, is not. Of course, in both cases, the main uh, objective of Russia, uh, Russia has enough territories, but in 2008 and 2014, uh, the, uh, the more important uh, the, the objective uh, was uh, to uh, destroy these uh, uh, attempts of these countries to, to, uh, to have an, uh, another model than, than the Russian model based on the sovereign democracy and the uh, 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 the vertical of power. Uh, uh, the success of these models, of this uh, uh, alternative model that was proposed by Georgia, and it was quite successful, uh, and it is considered as successful by most of uh, people in the world, uh, except uh, in Russia and uh, maybe by the current government of Georgia, because there is a very uh, strong um, uh, uh, di divergences on the on this, but uh, broadly it's considered as a success. So uh, uh, many people in Russia could uh, use this uh, successful. I'm not saying that everything was successful, but it was mainly successful uh, experiences to to uh, try to criticize uh, the, the the Russian model. So this is something that uh, really uh, uh, made uh, nervous uh, Russian uh, Russian leadership. Um, um, so another set of uh, uh, similarities is the role that Russia has played uh, in uh, shaping separatist movements. Uh, uh, we are now talking about uh, hybrid uh, wars uh, in, in, or hybrid war in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, the, the main, the, the first hybrid war that Russia uh, waged uh, uh, was in the 90s, in, in, in 92, 93 in Georgia mainly in Abkhazia, where lots of different people, militias, uh, some, uh, some also uh, members of, uh, of regular Russian military forces, fought uh, against uh, uh, the, 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 the army, uh, regular army of Georgia in Abkhazia. At this time, also Russia uh, has never uh, uh, accepted and agreed to recognize that the Russian forces were fighting in Abkhazia against Georgia, but uh, there were clear evidences, such as once a Russian plane was shut down by Georgian artillery, and uh, maybe you remember or not, at this time the Minister of uh, Defense of Russian Federation, Pavel Grachov, has declared that that was a Georgian plane that was painted into Russian uh, plane and then uh, shut down to, in order to, to uh, accuse and to, to make uh, uh, accusations against, uh, against Russia. So this kind of uh, uh, hybrid war uh, existed already in the 90s. Uh, even the militias, the North Caucasian militias that came to, to Georgia, uh, at least partly they were manipulated uh, by, by the central, uh, by, by the Russian authorities because uh, uh, all of a sudden, this uh, confederation of mountainous peoples of Caucasus that was created uh, um, uh, just before the, the, the conflict has started in Abkhazia, uh, this confederation has disappeared or had, didn't play a role uh, during the war in Chechnya. This is quite, quite surprising because these people who uh, came to Abkhazia to defend small Caucasian uh, people against bigger, uh, also Caucasian people, but bigger uh, that they were depicting at, uh, as, as aggressor, these, uh, the same uh, soldiers, the same uh, volunteers, uh, didn't appear, and, uh, didn't play a role during the Chechen war. And that was much bigger and much more violent war than, than in Georgia. Um, so the separatist authorities, these separatist authorities in South Ossetia especially, 
uh, especially starting from 2004, were the direct nominees from, from the Russian Federation. You take the minister cabinet of South Ossetia in 2004, 2005, 2006, uh, half of these people were Russian, not only Russian citizens, because in the meantime, Russian passports were distributed in the region, but these people were directly uh, came from Russia and not only from the um, uh, regions like North Ossetia or uh, there were some people from Northern Ossetia, but people from r the region of Chelyabinsk. The people like Mr. Bar Barankevich, who became the, the, uh, the, the head of National Security uh, Council of South Ossetia, had, he has never been in South Ossetia before, but he was uh, directly uh, nominated there as a, uh, um, and uh, most of these people had a very direct connection to, to the Russian uh, different uh, services. Uh, budget, 96% of South Ossetian state budget was direct transfers from 96% from, from Russia. In Abkhazia it was less, but it was still something uh, between 60 and 65%. Um, uh, and the room for maneuver of, of these separatists uh, was uh, 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 progressively diminishing and uh, paradoxically the room for maneuver became much less, uh, uh, so much smaller after the, the recognition of the independence of, of these two entities by Russia uh, in August 2008. I always quote one of my friends, Abkhaz friends who is a journalist, he said, you know what, uh, before 2008, we were uh, independent but, but not recognized. Now we are recognized but not independent anymore. So that, that was a, a, a kind of joke, but uh, he, uh, it was a very, uh, it reflects really the, the, the reality because since the, this recognition, uh, Russian military presence in these two regions has increased. Uh, uh, their military bases were uh, quite big military bases both in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, and uh, uh, the room for maneuver for these uh, uh, republics are now close to zero. Can you imagine that when uh, all the population of Abkhazia and South Ossetia participate in Russian elections, parliamentary and presidential elections, and even the presidents of South Ossetia and Abkhazia go and vote and elect their president. And there was a such comical situation when the Abkhaz president was uh, interviewed when he was, uh, after he just put his ballot in the, uh, uh, in the in the box, and so journalists is asking for you. You have voted for uh, yes. I, my president is Vladimir Putin. He said so. The president of the president. Uh, can you imagine this this uh, situation that uh, a president of the country is electing his president, who is uh, president of another country, uh, uh, and uh, uh, different kind of. Um, uh, situations like this. Mr. Surkov, who is one of the, who was, and he's again one of the closest um, uh, advisors of Vladimir Putin, was appointed as a curator, curator of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Can you imagine that uh, 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 a person who is an uh, aide or advisor of a president, of a Russian president, being in charge uh, of two countries, independent countries, and he is a Authority when the presidents of these two countries want to speak to Russian um, uh, authorities, uh, uh, they have to speak to him, and only for protocol, uh, pro protocol they can uh, meet and uh, uh, have pictures with uh, with Vladimir Putin, of course. Um, uh, and new treaties that Russia is uh, now uh, signing with the, these two uh, regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia are uh, even more uh, resembling to the uh, to annexation direct annexation because after these treaties uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia will not have any more, so they, their military forces or, or power ministries will, will fusion will, uh, with, with the Russian ones. So there's no need anymore with the economic crisis maybe to, to, to pay both, uh, both um, so in parallel uh, uh, law enforcement bodies, now they will become part of, of Russian uh, uh, law enforcement bodies, etc., etc. So you, you see that the, the idea of, uh, um, uh, you know, these separatist uh, uh, regions having uh, uh, room for maneuver or they can disobey or they can, um, uh, they can not accept what, what Russia is, uh, 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 Russian decisions are very, very limited. Um, uh, another um, set of uh, uh, similarities is the virtual reality that Russian media uh, has created about uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine. Uh, 
the, the, this virtual reality was first experienced in Georgia in 2008. The idea that uh, Russia is fighting not Georgia but is fighting NATO, that was already uh, 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 already uh, uh, developed by Russian media in 2008. Now Vladimir Putin says that Russia is uh, fighting, uh, uh, Ukrainian army is a, is a NATO legion. Um, uh, the idea of the genocide, so the, the, the very first day of the conflict in South Ossetia, all Russian media uh, were talking about the genocide of the, of the Ossetian population, 2,000 deaths in one night, and uh, uh, this, is, this, uh, this looks very similar of, what, uh, of, of the idea of genocide of uh, Russian-speaking population in Crimea or in eastern Ukraine on crucified children, etc., etc. So all this appeared to be uh, not true, and, but this is the reality in which uh, Russian um, uh, citizens live. Um, and uh, one in one of the interviews uh, shortly after uh, the, the war in Georgia, Vladimir Putin has declared that that was the vice president of the United States, Dick Cheney, that ordered uh, Saakashvili to, to attack Russia. That, that, that was something that he directly declared, and this direct responsibility of fighting the United States, fighting NATO, uh, and now, we, in the in case of Ukraine, the, the circle of enemies has broadened, and now European Union is part of this uh, uh, coalition of uh, evil coalition against Russia, and they are trying uh, to, uh, to destroy Russia not only militarily but also on the level of ideologies. Uh, uh, the, the, this, all these uh, ideas of decadent, uh, gay and uh, minority-friendly Europe that tries to, uh, to, uh, uh, to destroy Russia. Uh, in 1992, I'm just, uh, the, I, I have no time to develop all, all these uh, techniques of, uh, uh, of uh, propaganda. In 1992, uh, uh, when f first conflicts uh, started in Georgia, uh, in Abkhazia, in, in South Ossetia, there was not a shadow of NATO. So this, this war took place, uh, and Georgia has, no, even in the wildest dreams of the most pro-Western or pro-American Georgian politicians, there was no idea of, of uh, possibility to, to join NATO, and, uh, uh, but the, the, the war was, was here. So it's not uh, the, the, uh, the NATO uh, uh, that pushed Georgia, uh, at least in the, in the 90s, to, to provoke Russia. And uh, uh, so this NATO idea is uh, uh, globally and, uh, and to a largest extent uh, 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 justification for internal use, but also external use for some political forces in the West. Diplomatic tactics are also similar. Uh, I, would, I have no time to, 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 to show uh, in details, but I will, say, I will uh, uh, name only one uh, tactic that is uh, that Russia has always pretended to be, uh, uh, not to be a, uh, a part of the conflict. Um, uh, that's why um, uh, Russia has always tried to uh, um, uh, to um, empower the separatists like uh, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, now LNR and DNR, to, to, uh, to consider them and to, to force the West to consider them as, as parties, as independent players in the, in, in the game. And Russia is <coughs> intervening only on the level of European Union on the United States. So this, this is a very uh, practical mean uh, for the Russians uh, to uh, First, to, to show that they, they, they are not involved or they are involved as an just interested uh, power, but also when the, the hardest decisions or when, when, uh, when the need is to, uh, to, to take, to be, uh, to be uh, to not to be constructive or to, to, uh, to destroy some uh, possible agreements, uh, uh, at this time LNR or DNR and Abkhaz or Rosset uh, just appear and they say, we, are, we, are not, we don't agree with this with this plan, the plan that could be, uh, uh, could be um, endorsed by, by Russia. This is, that was the whole tactics in Geneva talks, uh, when uh, Geneva talks after Georgian conflict, where Georgia, uh, Russia, European Union, OEC, uh, 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 and, uh, and uh, the US were present, with the co-chairs, and then on the second level, the representatives of the separatist entities. Some, some level of agreements could be uh, achieved between Russia uh, and Georgia, and then the most, at the very last moment, the representatives of the separate, separatist uh, entities could say, no, we don't agree, and then Russia said, look, look, we, we agree, but they, they cannot agree with that, so this, uh, these agreements could, uh, could disappear. So last uh, uh, five minutes, 
about uh, the, the, the Western attitudes. And uh, I see also uh, similarities, and it was already mentioned by, by Stefan Fuller this morning, the difficulties we have in the West to understand Russia, to understand the 20 years or 20, almost 24, 25 years after to the end of the, of the Cold War, what really happened in this country. Uh, we underestimated the, the, the idea or the perception that the Russians have about the grievances, the humiliation, and the uh, level of uh, uh, desire of revenge that, that was in this country uh, during all these years. Um, uh, the humiliation, of course, the discourse of humiliation is a, is a, is, is a construction. Of course, everybody now when we have a, a, a radical jihadist terrorism in, in, say in France, these people, they say, okay, we, we do that because we are humiliated. Everybody is humiliated. And the, 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 the discourse of humiliation is something that is constructed and uh, we shouldn't take it as, 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 as granted. Of course, the, the, the Russians, and especially um, uh, these people from uh, former power uh, ministries or for, from KGB, uh, etc., they feel humiliated. But uh, this is the discourse that was imposed progressively in the Russian society. And I don't believe that simple Russian citizens uh, felt humiliated when Kosovo was recognized as independent country. They just don't care. They, it, was, it was not their, their problem. But that was the problem of the political elites, and that was uh, something that was, uh, con that, that was constructed or, or uh, built up. So the Western answers to, okay, now we should, maybe if we appease Russia because they feel so humiliated on some smaller issues, it will stop. Uh, that happened after the war in Georgia. There was some kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding or some, uh, 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 some tensions for several months, and then uh, uh, everything uh, came back as, as, as uh, business as usual. The Americans have started a, a reset, hoping that, okay, they, they got basically what they wanted in, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and then Georgia is not a NATO member, so now it will stop. Same thing in Ukraine. So when the, of course, when the occupation and annexation of Crimea happened, that was something terrible and it was condemned. But Western uh, uh, diplomats and Western governments hoped that, okay, that, that will stop with Crimea and some Western politicians also tried to uh, dilute this idea, saying, okay, but Crimea is so complicated, it was Russian and it was just given to Ukraine in 1950, 1954, etc., etc. So, the, but we see that it's, they, 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 they're always underestimating the, the level of uh, grievance and the desire of revenge that the current uh, uh, Russian uh, government has, because for them, the defeat, uh, for them the Cold War was the war that they lost. That's the, at least in, in Putin's mind is that he lost the war, now he has to recover and he has to, if he can and if he believes that, uh, uh, the West is weak, and now is the time to, to recover and to reverse this, uh, um, uh, these tendencies. Uh, so we, uh, and the Commissioner Fuller has mentioned also that the, the difficulties to have a coherent position uh, on uh, Eastern neighbors about enlargement, etc. And inside our, our when I say <coughs> our, I mean Western European societies, we have many groups, many interest groups, political groups, that are moved by other priorities, like... Uh, you know, just an anti-Americanism. Now, now anti-Europeanism also. We have uh, uh, different political groups uh, starting from extreme left to extreme right that, uh, that are uh, Europhobic or uh, uh, Eurosceptic at least, uh, uh, sovereignist as we say in France. And they all see Vladimir Putin as a, their iconic leader. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that happens in our Western European societies and uh, Every time I, I have TV debates uh, with my colleagues uh, in France, or last time I was in a, in a French uh, uh, National Assembly at the Commission of uh, Foreign Affairs, I was surprised how, how many uh, MPs from different parties have uh, the, the, this vision of, okay, but uh, this is a conflict that the Americans want. Uh, and we have interests uh, in Russia, economic interests, etc. So these people are still uh, unable to understand what you said, that this is all about us, it's also about France and it's about, about themselves also because, uh, and there were also comparisons with Afghanistan or we gave weapons to the, to the Afghan Mujahideen and then it has ended in a, the ta Taliban took power. So what we're talking about, the, Ukraine is a European country and they, they are fighting, uh, ideologically they are fighting our, our, our battle. 
Afghan Mujahideen has never fought uh, our battle. They were, they were in their own independence uh, war. And uh, uh, the, comparing these two, two wars, or Iraq wars, we helped uh, Iraqis to overthrow Saddam Hussein, and then uh, look what happened. So this is something that, that has nothing to do uh, together, Ukraine and uh, Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan. Um, the parallels, uh, uh, and I will end with these two points, um, uh, first, lack of capacity and will to, to confront Russia, of course, in Western Europe. And this is understandable. This is something that Vladimir Putin understands perfectly. The, and that's why uh, the last escalation uh, that started in January is, uh, is, uh, is uh, understood and is, is uh, wanted by Vladimir Putin because uh, the sanctions that, that, was the, 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 that were established by, by the Europeans and the Americans have a, an effect on Russian economy, but this effect is a, a mid-term or long-term effect. So uh, our strategy, Western strategy, is a, a long-term strategy. So it's in Vladimir Putin's interest to speed up things and to, to, uh, to escalate the conflict, knowing perfectly that we are not interested and we don't want and we are ready to give up many things in order to avoid uh, an open war with, uh, with Russia. So this uh, last escalation was a direct um, a response from uh, Vladimir Putin to, uh, in order to, uh, to obtain much better a deal, uh, probably, with, with Ukraine uh, 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 now in, in these negotiations in, in Minsk. Uh, and the, the last point is the parallelism between the talks, 2008, and uh, now the talks that are uh, uh, in, in, in Minsk. So, uh, when uh, President Sarkozy came to, to Georgia in 2008, uh, he had a clear agenda. The, the agenda was to, to bring uh, peace uh, quickly, um, uh, and uh, he, um, his agenda was not exactly the same uh, as the agenda of the Georgians, of course. The Georgian agenda was to safeguard the territorial integrity of the country. Uh, uh, officially, the, the, the European and the, Mr. Sarkozy's idea was also to safeguard Georgia's uh, uh, the territorial integrity, but the, 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 the peace, uh, this six-point agreement that was brought in Georgia was... Uh, uh, was a very general uh, agreement with uh, lots of uh, uh, possible uh, ambiguities. Uh, and that ambiguity was, uh, uh, was uh, on purpose, it was wanted by, 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 by Russia that, that could give them a possibility to interpret uh, this agreement uh, differently. Uh, and the Georgians had no, no, no possibility to object. Uh, they, okay, they, they, they tried to negotiate the whole night long, but they had no, their uh, capacity to resist this uh, six-point agreement was very limited because Sarkozy was the last friend who came. And he said, okay, if you don't sign it, I will leave, and tomorrow the Russian tanks are, un, are in Tbilisi. So it was very tough negotiations. And I w I'm a bit afraid that... Uh, Vladimir Putin has military superiority now in Ukraine, this is uh, so obvious, uh, and Europeans do not want to arm Ukraine, at, at least so they it announced it before even started negotiations uh, with, uh, uh, with Vladimir Putin, would be, uh, uh, they, they, their, their position is quite weak in these negotiations. So uh, how they would, uh, I, and I'm afraid, and I hope it will not happen, and that Georgia, an example, would serve as a, as a lesson, that the agreement would be as detailed as possible, because not giving room for interpretations. I can tell you the, 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 how the words were played in different Russian and French version of a six-point agreement and how it was immediately used by, uh, by the Russians, and as detailed as possible and uh, uh, as strong guarantees as possible for uh, Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity. Because the, the, the provision that was in six-point agreement about the the status of Abkhazia and South Ossetia was not clear enough. Uh, of course, there was not a single mention of possibility of independence of these regions, but the Russians uh, uh, recognized it and then said, I don't see uh, where in this six-point agreement there is clear, clear uh, mention of that never, ever uh, these two regions will become independent. And of course, the fact that the Russian side uh, do, did not accept uh, the, the uh, European monetary mission, UMM, uh, on the other side of the separation line. It's also, also they, they said, okay, but you, the, you are, uh, you're mentioning in this six-point agreement that European side should monitor the ceasefire, 
But there is no clear mention that they should monitor on both sides of the separation line, and so we do not allow them to, to be on the other side, uh, on the other side of the of the of the separation line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, now the, the challenge is that uh, the Ukrainians have uh, very few, uh, uh, you know, possibilities to resist uh, 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 a bad deal that could be. Uh, uh, that could be uh, uh, proposed by, by Vladimir Putin, and he will probably pr propose a very bad deal for Ukrainians. And I hope that the current uh, French and uh, German leadership will uh, take uh, you know, the conclusions from uh, 2008, and they will be as firm as possible in order to make a very clear uh, peace plan in, in Minsk. I will stop here, and I'm ready to answer your question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Gordaja, thank you very much for these insightful uh, comments and perspectives, uh, especially alerting broader implications of, of, of Ukraine for Europe and, and wider regions. Now we have 15 minutes left for questions. Uh, please keep your questions short. Um, and um, just raise your hand, please, if there's any question. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation and, and a, a very particular perspective. I was going to ask originally um, how you think uh, we can progress without stoking up the, the, the fears and the paranoia uh, from the Russian side, but I suppose I would change that now to ask, um, in your opinion, do you feel it's worth trying to address those specific fears? Sorry, excuse me, what did you say? Uh, the, the I was going to change it to, do, do you actually think it is worth trying to address those specific fears. Okay. Do you want to go one by one or get a number of them? Yeah, yeah I, can, I can go uh, one by one. Okay. Um, so this is very difficult to know what are real fears uh, from the Russian side because um, there are these fears really... Uh, I, sometimes I have doubts that, they, that at least the leadership, they really believe in these fears when they... When they say that NATO is uh, approaching Russian borders, so what, there is a not a single, you know, NATO strategy is like 28 countries discussing about, uh, you know, about strategy, and these documents are, are public and visible. There's not a single mention that um, now, yeah, they are becoming, uh, the, the, there are lots of reference to Russia, but Russia is a threat for some member states, uh, NATO member states, but never, ever, uh, NATO has considered since the, the disappearance of the, of the Warsaw Pact and the and Soviet Union that Russia was the enemy of, of NATO. In Russian uh, strategy uh, documents, you have NATO mentioned as the, the principal, principal threat. Uh, so the, the, yeah, Russian fears should of, of course discuss these fears, but I don't know how instrumental these fears are, or how real they are. Of course, the Russian uh, broad public and audience believe that uh, this bloody uh, NATO and the European Union, they want to destroy Russia, of course, and they are replaying the Second World War because they are now supporting the uh, Nazi regime in, in Ukraine. Of course, this is something you cannot talk about this. So it's, it's, you cannot talk about such uh, imaginary things, uh, uh, really. So about NATO, yes, but at the same time, uh, uh, I have the impression that, uh, okay, you can uh, talk about NATO, but there, is an, there will be another uh, menace that will, that will be pointed out. Because Russia, again, as you said, um, needs a confrontation, external confrontation, in order first to, to consolidate uh, the, 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 uh, the opinion behind uh, the leadership. And the real threats, like... Uh, no, I don't know, the, 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 the Chinese uh, 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 becoming more and more assertive are not, are not discussed in Russian uh, uh, audience and the Russian media. Uh, even the Islamic uh, fundamentalism, or it's, it's now becoming like secondary. The first menace is the West. Uh, and uh, really, uh, in, in real terms, uh, these two uh, uh, possible menaces are much more important for Russia than than the Western threat, but again, the, the, this is very instrumental and very, you cannot, um, uh, you cannot uh, reassure or uh, um, uh, the Russia constantly because there will be other, other, uh, other fears that will, will pop up for sure. Okay, great. Any other question? Okay, yes, gentleman in the front. 
Hi, Dr. Martin, your crime citizen here in Ireland, and uh, my question, it's really straight. It's looked like the Russian propaganda works, and uh, Europe is still uh, worries, and uh, uh, what's going to happen next? Next of what? Next of uh, this force of Russian propaganda on the West, on the... Mm, okay. This is, I... I, I I, I don't know how, how far it can go and what, what will be next uh, in Russia and also in Europe. You mean in, in Europe? Um, in Europe, uh, in Europe is specifically, um, it depends also on the capacity of economic possibilities of Russia to, to promote this kind of, you know, we, you have the Russia Today, there was a plan to launch Russia Today in French. With the current crisis, it was postponed we don't know how, how long it, this, uh, the, it, it will stand, but um, uh, the, maybe the, one of the possible answers is the, now the idea to create a Russian-speaking uh, media uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the fi financed by, by the European Union. Uh, also, uh, no. <laughs> uh, another, uh, another possibility no, is, uh, sorry? You hope not. Okay, that's it. Uh, uh, I think. I think. You cannot fight the bad propaganda with the good propaganda. But please give us other. No, no, I, I spoke about that in the morning. Okay, but in Europe, I think uh, uh, unless there is no clear uh, discussion about uh, uh, what happened in Russia, what is going in Russia, and how we are concerned with uh, with what is going on in Russia. There are still there will be these kind of people who are uh, who who who, are, who have other priorities, and they will always see in Putin and in Putin the, the, the talking points that are proposed by Russia. You know, in France there was a debate about these Mistral ships, okay, uh, and uh, the, the, it was postponed, and I'm very happy it was. Uh, but at the same time, you had people uh, locally speak in in this region where the, 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 these uh, these boats are are built. Um, uh, very local discussion, uh, and the National Front, which is the, the far, far right party, uh, they even didn't mention Russia at all. They, they said, okay, this is the, the, our jobs, etc., etc. It was the way to attack uh, the local uh, government and also the, the, the French government, saying that this government is just not safeguarding uh, the, our uh, interests, as, 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 and the, the, discuss, the discussion was only economic. But at the same time, we know that they have very strong links with, the, with Russia. So uh, the, the, the fact is that unless Europe and Western Europe is not really concerned and don't feel that they are concerned and they don't say the truth, uh, okay, because this is really a confrontation and we, uh, the, the government still hesitates because there are lots of other problems, uh, uh, unemployment, uh, economic crisis, now Islamic terrorism. So adding that also, it's, it's very difficult because we live in democracies and... Uh, uh, this kind of uh, people do not like to to have uh, you know, other other difficulties and other problems. So, this is the the, the real the real threat. And uh, I don't know how far it it will go. It will it, probably it will continue, and it will depend on Russia's capacity also to promote this kind of uh, uh, you know media and uh, ideas through the media. We have a question from the gentleman in the front. Thank you, Frank O'Donnell, former UN representative in Ukraine from 2004-2009. It, it seems to me that, um, and it's a question to you in a sense, that there are lessons from the process of detente during the Cold War that we should return to. And perhaps you'd like to indicate what they might be from your perspective. Let me just give an example. Um, detente came about because partly there was the threat of mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rising military expenditures on both sides of the Iron Curtain were becoming astronomical and out of control. Something had to be done. There was no clear prospect of an outright winner in a, in a nuclear conflict. We're in a situation today where most of us are not paying sufficient attention to the ideological underpinnings of the Putin regime from people like uh, Alexander Dugin, for example. We're not recognizing that there's a major ideological rift emerging between, uh, as it were, the Russian sphere and the Western sphere, which to me is one of the great tragedies of the 21st century. You would have thought that in the era of the internet and the information revolution, that people would be, the global village, that we would all be thinking more and more the same thing. 
But what has happened is that through the process of globalization, through deregulation of markets and industry consolidation, major economic players emerge in different industries. We see mergers and acquisitions, industry consolidation, and the emergence of oligopoly. We see the same in the media market. And I had a very interesting conversation once with Federico Mayor, the former director general of UNESCO, who is a Spaniard, and he said, Frank, what are we going to do? Silvio Berlusconi owns half the media in Spain, not just <laughs> Italy. And the problem we have, I think, is economically that the media conglomerates are taking over. It's okay maybe in, 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 in a free, free democratic space, but not in a place like Russia. Even in the West, it's a threat. And you're working now in France. I understand that in France, and this is in the light of the Charlie Hebdo story, that in France there is a law that prevents an owner of one newspaper owning another newspaper. It, it may not exist anymore, but it did once. And it's one of the sorts of things that can help keep competition and diversity of opinion, opinion in the public sphere. So what are the lessons of detente? Just just for the uh, question. Yeah. Uh, that should be the last question because we're. Uh, no? Do you want to respond okay. to that? Because we're running out of time. Five more minutes left. Maybe a short question, on. last one. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Short. Uh, Maria from uh, Ukrainian Connection Society. Uh, it's about European Union. So in your point, what do you think, what are first immediate steps that European Union should take to try to improve the situation? Thank you. Short question. <laughs> Half a million. Um, I think what's, what they are doing now in Minsk, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good thing, and it was urgent to do that, especially after announcing that there will be no military uh, deliveries to Ukraine. It was just urgent to immediately go and uh, talk to, to Vladimir Putin to show that uh, we have a common position and coherent position, and there is no division uh, between the Western and Central Europeans, because that's the main objective of of Moscow uh, inside the EU or also inside the NATO to, 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 to show that there are divisions. And uh, also, and I, it will be, uh, I, I don't want to be accused uh, as being like a very pro-Atlantist, but we need also a consolidated and uh, common position with the Americans on these issues. We may disagree on, may, on plan, plenty of other issues, but on these issues, because this is about security and hard security, Unfortunately, uh, e European Union is not about hard security, and Vladimir Putin needs to see a hard security. So we need them on these particular issues to be on board and to act together with us. Would you like to respond to the tone? Uh, or do no, I, I, I perfectly understand your, your point, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a different situation than the, the, under the, the, the Iron Curtain, but... Uh, but uh, uh, somehow the ideological influence of uh, uh, not, not only specifically Dugin, but this kind of Eurasianism, and uh, it's even uh, stronger now because they, they have access to Western media. That was not the case under Soviet Union. They were only some communist parties inside Western society that were supporting them. But now it's, it's more diffuse because we have inside mainstream parties sometimes. You have uh, some politicians who are inside center-right and center-left who take positions that are very, very strange. So uh, yeah, the, the, the influence is now, uh, the soft power is now more diffuse and uh, more, less centralized maybe, but uh, penetrates uh, different uh, levels of the society. I, I would just say that <coughs> That's the, the NATO countries, only two uh, NATO countries fulfill, or two or three, the, the yeah. 2%. And uh, among the 20 countries that have the most, uh, cut the most uh, military expenditures in the world, like 15 out of 20 are NATO members. So that's the, you have the answer, beginning of the answer why we have the problem. Great. Well, thank you very much for this lively discussion.